Thank you for that brief introduction. <laughs> Uh, I misbehaved when we were getting ready for this, so they took away wi my wireless mic, and now I'm forced to use this, and I'm fighting the temptation to break into song. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, my privilege to welcome you here today and to introduce our panelists. It should be a very interesting discussion touching on a rapidly changing consumer marketplace, different ways of shopping, different ways of attracting shoppers, and we have a panel that's certainly qualified to discuss that. Starting off on my immediate right, your immediate left, uh, Kimberly Grable is Senior Vice President of Saks Fifth Avenue, for, responsible for marketing for the 50 full-line stores and the 55 off-fifth outlet stores that make up the store. In this role, she is responsible for consumer research, brand strategy, advertising, database, and direct marketing, customer development and loyalty programs, public relations and special events, and production. Kimberly joined Saks in 1995, holding positions of increasing responsibility in the marketing department. And prior to that, she was Director of International Trade for the Leslie Fay Companies. And I found out from reading her bio that I was at Carnegie Mellon down the street in Pittsburgh, and she was at the University of Pittsburgh, where she got her degree. <laughs> to Kimberly's right, we have Lena Kotsukvikaya. How did I do on the pronunciation? Not very well. Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that objective evaluation. I guess I'll let her introduce, reintroduce herself. <laughs> Vice President of Advertising at Barney's New York. Uh, after receiving a foreign arts degree in her native Soviet Union, you rem may remember our great Cold War adversary who no longer is, uh, Lena came to New York and uh, continued her studies at Parsons School of Design and went on to teach there. Uh, she was tapped to helm the redesign and launch of Condé Nast Teen Vogue. And under her creative direction, the magazine went on to be acknowledged by both the ASME and the SPD taking the silver medal in the category of redesign in 2003. She left editorial to explore fashion advertising as the VP of advertising at Barney's New York. And it's nice to have a former editorial specialist on the panel with me today. Uh, finally, on your left and my right, we have Carl Sparks, the president and chief marketing officer of Guilt Group, uh, who comes to us with an online travel background. Uh, prior to joining Guilt, Carl served as general manager for Hotels.com USA in Canada, while it was the second largest operating unit of Expedia Incorporated and had nearly $2 billion in annual bookings. Before leading Hotels.com, Carl was the chief marketing officer for Expedia, where he was responsible for driving a $10 billion revenue business by leading the areas of brand strategy, creative development, and marketing communications. He has also been with Capital One, Guinness, PepsiCo, and the Boston Consulting Group. Graduated summa cum laude, figured we'd get that in, uh, from Princeton University, and then went on to receive his MBA from a school up in Boston known as Harvard University that some of you may have heard of. His email address is given on the bio, but I think I'll leave that to, uh, to others for then. So to begin our presentations today, we have Kimberly Grable from Saks Fifth Avenue. And we thought we'd share with you a case study on some multi-channel marketing we've recently done on Jimmy Choo 24-7. So a little bit about Saks, hopefully you know. Um, we are a luxury retailer of um, European and American designer brands with our own strong internationally recognized brand. And that creates an added dimension for us as marketers and as creative people that simultaneous to whatever brand we may be promoting or whatever product category we may promo or be promoting, we also need to promote the Saks Fifth Avenue brand itself. We are a brand and we are a house of brands. And straddling both is important in everything that we do. We'll have 50 stores um, this summer and um, also Saks.com. Now those businesses are run somewhat separately and you'll find this, I think a lot of the larger retailers have separate dot-com groups. So the online marketing group um, reports into the online business which reports into the CEO. The marketing group um, reports into the CEO directly, so kind of two separate groups, separate channels. Um, but obviously, we need to work very closely together. You know, the, the customer does not care who reports to who, um, does not care what silo you happen to be in. The customer sees you as one brand. And so from a marketing and creative perspective, it's very important that we work together to make sure that everything we do feels right for the one brand that is Saks Fifth Avenue. We have five international stores and really find that our customer base, and this is why it's so critical that we have a, a united point of view, they shop across channels. Um, and all of the research that you'll see holds true for 
it's two customers who shop more than one channel spend a lot more with a brand in total so it's all good and convincing a store brick and mortar organization that dot com is really good for them is not always the easiest thing to do but that's certainly um, what we find to be the truth our marketing includes national and local efforts you may be reading a lot about um, the localization that we're doing we create customized ads for all of our 50 stores um, so every local magazine ad that runs speaks specifically to why you would want to shop in that Saks store in that market. What do they have exclusively? What makes them different? Um, so this customization, this localization is, is critically important. Direct mail and loyalty marketing, our loyalty program, Saks First, is um, tops in the industry. And so a lot of our, our customers belong to that. It's a major source of revenue, so a lot of our marketing goes to that. Advertising, as I said, national and local, as well as newspaper, PR, um, social media. We are playing in the social media space, as most people are these days. Um, store outreach and really doing business development plans, again, by store. Um, and then Saks.com is a marketing channel, too. So a little bit about us and what we're known for. We have our seasonal campaigns. This past season was Think About. Um, Think About followed several seasons of the campaign called Want It which was all about the things that you want at Saks, because we are the first ones willing to admit um, that we sell things that you want, may or may not necessarily need. Depends on how you define need. So um, wanted, however, given the tenor of the consumer and given the economy, really felt needed to evolve. So we went to the softer suggestion of think about. Um, here we're, we're asking you to think about um, Z-Spoke, which is a new line that we've developed exclusively with Zach Posen. Um, so these are some of our um, other areas. One double O double two shoe, hopefully you've heard about. The designer shoe department so big it has its own zip code. Um, the Postal Service regretted that deeply once they agreed to it, um, but we've been running with it ever since. Um, and then Key to the Cure is our annual uh, major charity event um, supporting women's cancers. And actually Uma Thurman is our um, ambassador this year. And this is the first anyone is seeing of the t-shirt the for um, this event, which was designed by Donna Karen. Um, just some examples of a pr our press coverage. And again, with mo most of what we're doing, we're looking for some unique hook that will be able to garner press. So the case study I was going to talk about today is Jimmy Choo. Um, they're a huge designer um, shoe resource for us. We think there's a lot of growth um, opportunity here. And they came to us with this idea of 24-7, this idea that women need a wardrobe of shoes, which most women would agree. Um, but this idea of high heels, low heels, sandals, going out shoes, going to work shoes. And how do you wrap that and spin that into a message that makes women think they need a lot more Jimmy Choo's in their wardrobe? Um, so this idea of taking a woman from day to evening, seven days a week, was the challenge we were faced with. So really growing sales and increasing penetration of this resource across Full Line and Saks.com was where we started. And the opportunity was about creating this need for a wardrobe of shoes. We had broad inventory coverage. It was in 42 stores. And we also wanted to leverage Tamara moving to New York, which was happening at the same time. So our strategy from the beginning, and I think you're going to talk a lot today about what's changed and how we think about marketing. For us, what's changed is the first thing we do is get a cross-functional team together in the room. Everything we do has to feel to the consumer of one piece. So this cross-functional team was designed to have a multi-channel approach with one project manager, who's here today, Carla Dunham, spearheading all of what we did. The goal was to grow Jimmy Choo sales across Saks Fifth Avenue. And we dragged every single person remotely involved in this project to the showroom to see every one of these shoes. Um, needed them to get excited, needed them to start thinking from each and every one of their individual areas, what were they going to do? What would their be contribution be to this larger effort? Um, and then making sure that our results were measurable, very important to us as a big company. So the creative is really across all of the channels. And again, the, one of the questions we'll talk about later is how do you adjust creative across channels? Sometimes you have to. And there are absolutely cases where we fall in love for, with something that works very effectively in print media, less so in online. And, and sometimes you have to be flexible. But to the degree that we can, we want to really see that consistency follow through. So what you're seeing here 
um, are the catalog shots that we did. We took over our, our wear women's um, clothing catalog and put Jimmy Choo throughout the catalog, wardrobed, so that you could really see the story of go to work, going out at night, going to, you know, out on the weekends. Um, and that story then followed through invitations, email blasts. We did something on Facebook and lots of press outreach. We worked with Closet Couture on a fun kind of program where you could wardrobe your own set of um, Jimmy Choo ensembles. So the results were that the creative carried through everything that we did um, and really by working cohesively on the dot-com side, on the store side, we were able to beat sales projections by over 50% and have over 30 million press impressions. So we saw this as a really great um, opportunity for us to work together on a common platform that was consistent and really drove the results. And I know we're going to talk some more in the, in the questions about how these two channels work together, but we thought this was an interesting example to share with you. So the uh, speech therapist is a must with my last name, but it's OK. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about Barney's um, from a more creative point of view um, because I represent the advertising department so it's more driven from the campaign uh, conceptual concept and um, moving into how you translate the images we shoot for printed matter into the online and um, what kind of concepts we're developing. I'll give you some previews. We're working on um, for the fall I'm not sure if I got a clearance from my other members of Barney's, but hopefully they're not here. So, um, so Barney's New York, we do um, uh, campaigns, very traditional way. We commission photographers, we come up with a concept. We put all our best efforts into printed material. We um, showcase it in catalogs. We call them mailers because they're not really particular catalog. Um, we always come up with a little bit of a narrative. Barney's always separates itself uh, from other luxury retailers by quirky attitude and um, a little bit of um, a little bit of a lifestyle where it penetrates with you and stays with you. Um, you know, some activity with a knife, you know, and some with the peeling potatoes and. Um, we have um, a brand within the brand, which is the co-op stores, which um, is um, we're opening a store in Brooklyn, and the new store is coming up in Santa Monica. We do very well with this concept of the co-op. It's a younger designer concept uh, where we can, you know, be a little bit more courageous, out outrageous, contagious. That's the tagline. Um, so um, we do, you know, we represent brands as Alexander Wang and VPL. Um, so we do menswear and women's wear for that, come up with the creative solutions like men putting on makeup in the hotel rooms. Um, we have also men's wear. I mean, all of these are representative of what I do. So, and, on, and going back to um, all of these campaigns, you could see that they have to, to be quite different you know, in approach, but still speak Barney. So it's how, how do you keep identity of the brand is a big challenge in, in the, such a fast moving pace where, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue is doing their campaigns and Guild Group is, you know, bombarding my mailbox every day. <laughs> um, so we, we, what we try to do is keep the creativity at the highest level and, um, and use our printed matter into um, connecting with the online. So for one, we did the, the beauty campaign we did last season, which was mailed out, was about the twi Twitters, you know, like we had the beauty VP, she was tweeting all the time about, you know, beauty concepts. She now has a lot more followers because we put, we tweeted about every product on every page. So combining a little bit of an online concept into the printed matter, we try, you know. I don't know if we succeed sometimes, but. Um, we come up with the concepts, how we promote our own labels online. Um, we're always bringing some sort of story. Simon Doonan works a lot with the brand on the copy and his quirky tones are very beneficial to the concept. We also introduced Be Social this year, um, which is um, the blog and all the elements of the YouTube content, um, 
uh, the, the blog itself, the mobile device. We don't have an iPad application. We, it's something that we're working on. We're also trying to bring in editorial concepts into the concept of your experience being online and obviously introducing the product where people could shop, but um, trying to connect the concepts of the storytelling to the merchandise. And this is one of the challenges where how do you close the sale? That's one of the questions. But um, my background always been editorial, so I feel that if we give it some sort of content and storytelling and belonging, the shopping comes with that. So we want to develop some sort of place where people go, not just to shop for a bag or for the shoe. Um, we also do outdoor advertising. You might have seen this on 7th Avenue. Um, so this is the concept that we did for um, the denim, which is a 3D denim delight concept. And this is launches in the fall. We shot it with a like traditional 3D camera, which is we went back rather than forward, not like un unlike you. <laughs> um, and we try to master the technique, which is a very basic technique, like following the trends. I mean, everybody talks about 3D. Um, Avatar changed the way we see movies now, and the reason why we go to see movies, sometimes unfortunately. <laughs> but um, so this is our 3D denim concept, with, which is going to come come out. The book is going to come with the glasses built in, and um, uh, and then we just played on the tricks. It's just the visual tricks. Everything is pretty much here. Is um, becomes more desirable once you view it properly with the proper attire. And because how can you justify, you know, selling denim for three hundred dollars when some others sell for fifty? <laughs> um, so you gotta have these challenges. You gotta explain why this denim is so special. So we try to make the campaigns correspond to that. Um, and it, it is a good denim, by the way. Um, so that's our creative. So something like this, we're going to be introducing on the iPad. We're working with a very high-end DC-based company to help us with technology component. And that's going to go on iPad, which is very exciting. So stay tuned in the fall when this is going to be a launch. And I'm passing this on to you. OK. Well, I'm um, glad you mentioned the iPad, because mostly we're going to talk about mobile and what we've been doing at Gilt on the mobile side. But I thought I'd just do a couple slides of introduction. Uh, so uh, at Gilt Group, style is a way of life. Our expertly curated sales make the aspirational accessible. Curated viral, up to 70% off. So you know, I think everyone understands the business. It's actually pretty easy to understand. You get the email, you come every day at, at noon, and you can buy the product. What it's hard to understand is how difficult it is to do it. It's like putting on a new show every day. It's um, you know, we, receiving the goods, photographing them, describing them, getting up on the site, and then publishing them at noon every day. It's a bit like a daily driven publishing schedule. Um, so um, you know, it, when you think about what it means to put our categories online, um, it's very different than, than the transformation that's happened in other product categories that have come online. I think when you put travel and flights online, it's actually a much better experience than it was to go to your travel agent. And you really don't lose anything there. Um, in fact, you get a lot to gain when you can compare, compare rates, compare prices. It's just much simpler than having the old days someone behind a green screen not showing you what was actually going on. And you know, arguably books and DVDs, when they go online, yes, you, you lose something from the store experience. You lose the pleasure of browsing. And now that there's coffee shops in the bookstores, you lose the aroma of, of the coffee. But arguably, there's a lot of things that are better when it's online. You don't lose a lot, but you actually gain a lot. It, the reviews um, from customers and, and the suggestions on other things you might like are actually superior. Now, in the categories that we're in, um, particularly in, in apparel and these coveted lifestyle goods, you lose, you lose something when you're not in the store. You don't have the salesperson. You don't have the store setting. And so we couldn't, at Gilt, just go ahead and just put the store online. Uh, we couldn't do just what Amazon and Expedia did and be successful. We had to find something else to replace what was lost from coming out of the store, which is why we deliberately make sure that we are not 
Amazon and not Expedia. We're not trying to be that. So on the left, you've got there's traditional e-commerce. And there's nothing wrong with traditional e-commerce. It's where I come from. Um, it's, it's reliable and it's convenient. But we wanted Gilt to be addictive and fun. Um, you know, in traditional e-commerce, there's everything. It's there all the time. You know you're going to find tons of books, tons of flights. We don't want to do that. We need to make it curated. Um, and traditional e-commerce is something you have to do. And we want guilt to be something you want to do. Um, and so on and so on. So what we're trying to do is, is, is create something that is fun, and it's simple, and it's fast. And it's something that you want to go do. I, don't think, I can't think of the last time that I just browsed my old website, Expedia, just for fun. Right? You're, you're very mission-driven when you go to those sites, when you go to Google and you start with search. Our customers, when they come to Gilt, are not mission-driven at all. They're uh, discovering what's going to happen at noon when the sale publishes. And so that's what we're trying to craft here. Um, these are our businesses. Um, November uh, 07, we launched with Women's Apparel. I won't read all of these, don't worry. Um, but since then, we've gone into a whole bunch of categories. But we continue to find the most recent ones, Jet Setter and Guilt City. Guilt City is in beta right now. About a half of our New York membership is getting the Guilt City emails, which is local services, spa services, uh, restaurants, things like that. Um, what we're discovering is that these um, vendors, the brands, really see Gilt as a marketing channel. Um, and we're getting terrific feedback. I'll just, you know, for example, many of the people, uh, vendors that we sell to in Gilt City are saying they're seeing about 50 or 60 percent of those customers that Gilt has originally brought in come back and buy full price afterwards. So whether it's a spa service, they initially buy at a discount, half of them are going upstairs and signing up for a full program. Uh, and so uh, increasingly, we're shifting the way we work with our brands to be a convenient and discreet outlet to actually becoming a marketing channel to help introduce these brands to young, affluent customers. OK, so let's move on to the case study um, on mobile. Um, you know, First of all, uh, why mobile? Why is it important to us? Um, well, as you know, our sales start at noon every day. But not everyone can be at their computer at noon. Uh, many of us are at work, uh, and not all of us uh, work for bosses that are understanding about getting up from a meeting, pretending to go to the ladies' or men's room, and in fact, actually going to your computer to, to shop. In fact, some companies have actually blocked us at the firewall so that their employees can no longer shop because they don't want to leave, uh, lose the productivity. So it really, st it really started out about wanting to get, um, initially on the iPhone, that extra shopping opportunity for somebody who, at noon, just couldn't get to us. Um, for example, on the West Coast, at noon Eastern, it's 9 AM there, some people are still commuting in their car. Um, so that's really why we started with uh, the mobile initiative. Um, why Apple? Um, two reasons, really. First of all, uh, they really are trying to drive a more visual approach to search, as opposed to the old paradigm of e-commerce, which is very text-driven search box, start with Google, or our Amazon drive down with deep menus. Um, and so we felt very aligned as companies, and we were driving visual discovery. And that's what they wanted their products to be all about. Uh, the second thing is we just looked at people who were hitting our site from the Safari browser on mobile. And we could see that of all the devices people were using, most of our customers were actually coming in through Apple devices. So we launched initially on uh, the iPhone. That was a big success for us. And then just most recently, we were one of the launch partners with Apple uh, for the iPad. Um, and you know, the, I think the, the, the interesting lesson that that I'd like to share on that is, you know, we actually designed different applications for these two devices. And different than our existing website, so the actual functionality, the size of the pictures is actually different than our core website. And actually, the iPad app itself is in turn different than the iPhone app. And that's because we designed them for different usage occasions. The iPhone really is about purely accessing the sale at noon. It's for those people that are hunting and want to buy at noon. Um, they're pulling their car over at noon because Burberry's on sale. And so that application is, divined, is set up to quickly get you to purchase. And that's the main goal of it. The iPad is designed with a very different usage occasion in mind. It's designed with the thought that it's on your coffee table, you're lounging back, you're sitting in your easy chair. It's designed to allow for a lot more discovery, a lot more wandering around, a lot more playing with the images and stretching and pushing them. So I think the main message here is, for anyone that's moving their business from store to website, website to mobile, is um, 
don't literally translate what you have today, but instead think about what use occasions you're trying to drive and then design something special for that. Um, one of the things that surprised us, again, I th think this might be interesting, is uh, the n amount of stuff and the different kinds of things that people are actually buying off the iPhone. Uh, we have initially thought they're going to buy straightforward things. They're so just going to buy sneakers and denim and candles. Uh, and in fact, we find them buying suits, $10,000 pieces of jewelry. Um, it, it has just amazed us how far we can push what people do on the device here. Um, so uh, I guess the lesson would be don't assume limitations uh, on any of these new ventures. Um, you know, as I've said earlier, you, 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 you want to design for the device. Um, you know, the other thing um, that we learned as, as we went into mobile is you have to, um, it's, particularly when you're working with Apple, it's very different than running your own website. In your own website, you're constantly doing little enhancements, little releases that you can do any time. The way it works with Apple is they have to approve your device changes. So you have to really bundle all your thinking very carefully around a major release. It then has to get pr approved by Apple, and then you push it out. So it changes the cadence of what you do in development, and it, it changes how you think about what you prioritize to put in development. Um, you know, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. The other thing is to think about how these devices enable different usage occasions, and that should not only change the, um, the user experience that you design, but actually changes the merchandise that you put on. And what we found was um, we had a very different day part when we put out our mobile apps. And so, for example, what used to be our slowest periods of time on the weekends where people, particularly as the weather gets nicer, they're not coming on at noon and shopping, Memorial Day was a very big day for us. And it was entirely because of these devices. On Memorial Day, nearly 20% of our revenue came through mobile devices, which, considering they're only a few months old, just, just shocked us. And what it told us is this really is a different usage occasion. And so we've started putting different products on there, um, products that might be more considered, like some of our travel sales we're going to be featuring, products for your home, where there isn't the same urgency as I've got one minute to get this pair of shoes or it's sold out. But we might have deeper depth of inventory. And again, these are goods that you might actually want to take the iPad home and, and you know zoom in on the throw pillow and actually hold the iPad up to your couch and say, I wonder if that's going to go there. So different merchandise, different uh, uh, interface design. Um, speed matters like crazy in mobile. Uh, you know, it matters on the web, yes. And actually, you can correlate conversion rate to how quickly um, your item master loads. but in mobile, it's even more important to be fast. And given wireless connectivity and the lag that you sometimes get, that's a tricky issue. We found that a user is going to give you a second, and if, this, if they're not seeing the page load, they're gone. So we're constantly optimizing on how do we cache stuff, how do we improve the design of the site so that it loads quickly, or at least gives the customer a sense of progress, even though that everything below the fold may not be loaded. Uh, coming ahead, and this is the last slide here, um, we're going to be driving a lot more sharing functionality uh, on these applications. So our next release, which we're actually waiting for Apple to approve today, uh, is going to have simple sharing functionality. So when you and your girlfriend are sitting there together and they say, well, what are you doing? And, the, and you say, well, look, I'm browsing Guilt. They can just simply hit a button and um, text you the link to join Guilt right from their address book. And so um, that's going to help the virality and the sharing. Um, we're going to allow sharing of sales, sharing of products that you find with your friends. Um, we're also going to be pushing out into other devices. We've, we've built an Android application. We're going to be building one for BlackBerry. And adding more sales. Um, we're going to be adding Jet Setter, the travel sales, to our mobile applications. Um, and we're actually going to be doing more exclusive sales for mobile, uh, given the comment earlier around the fact that it's a different usage occasion, different products. We actually think it might be fun to reward some of our users by offering sales that you can only get if you've downloaded our application. So mobile has been a fun ride for us. It's actually surprised us at how quickly it's taken off. And probably the, the, the greatest reward for us is that actually in rethinking how we would develop for these devices, it's improved the thinking upon how our core website should be. And in fact, our iPad application we now think is the best guilt experience there is. And we're struggling now to say, how do we actually make our core web application as good as the iPad. So it's been a very liberating experience for us as well. Thank you to all three panelists. Great presentations. And I'm sure the audience, please acknowledge them. 
it was interesting that te technically we went backwards from the clip-on mics to the handheld, but we're still in the world of wireless, and we don't want to be wired after all that coffee. Uh, I did want to uh, start out by saying we're going to there'll be a little bit of a split here, and the audience will have a chance to throw in some questions as well. Uh, a little bit of a split here between the bricks and mortar retailers who are moving online and Carl's situation, which was online to start. Uh, but I did want to start by asking um, uh, Lena and Kimberly, uh, to what degree uh, elements of the store experience are difficult to replicate online, and to what degree the messages that you convey in print, in out of home, for instance, as we saw in a few examples, uh, do those need to be modified as you move into the online world? What that you're doing as a bricks and mortar retailer just doesn't apply to you when you move into the online realm. Well, there's some things you can't do online. You can't try things on. So it, it's, you know, for a picky shopper, that would be a big problem. So you can, you know, try to shoot it at so many angles and put better models and, and you can visualize yourself to be that model and you might not be because you're size 12 and they're size six. So that's always a challenge, I think, you know. Um, so for Barney's, I mean, Barney's always been a store which had, as, um, as you mentioned, um, curated what, what Guild does as curation or editing of their merchandise. Is Barney's always been a good at editing their merchandise. Um, um, the buyers are very, um, curious and uh, inventive and so we have a good spread of merchandise I mean there is a difficulty which I, I guess you experiencing as well that certain b brands don't want to go and be sold online I mean um, sometimes I go on, on Barneys.com and I question why is so-and-so is not sold on Barneys.com yet so there is um, from the designers or vendors perception the online there's a hesitation as well where um, um, I think that once we overcome that, then the experience online will be just similar to experience in store. Because when you go in store, you've got so many more choices. Um, so um, what was the second part of well, that? Let's ask, when you're doing a shoot, for instance, now, right. I mean, we have this at Women's Wear Daily all the time. We now have to go in and anticipate what our online needs are going to be and not think, you know, we have one good shot that'll look good in 2D. Uh, you know, let's go with that. Right. Well, um, how, how is the experience actually of creating the marketing message been modified by the online presence? Well, when we do a campaign now, I always try to, I, I do ask, and, and some of the people in the audience probably are agents, and we always ask, uh, can we shoot some video? Can we shoot some video on the back of this? That's the question, that's the honest question. There is no money extra sometimes. Um, now we're carving money somewhere for extra things, but we feel like that's very important to have something that is moving. People don't want to be clicking through there has to be a moving image. I mean, we are moving into the space where moving image is important. I think um, the magazines potentially eventually will be the video stories where you're gonna see the merchandise and how that dress is gonna move and, and that's where we would be benefiting as well, where we could present the video story that somebody's wearing the dress, you can understand how it hangs and how it moves and, and you could see yourself better than on some model, irrelevant model to your body type. Uh, on the flatness. So for now, what we do, we, we do have a content which is video content online, so we're trying to get those experiences from the printed matter into the digital. Uh, Kimberly, could you handle the same question? Just tell us how your experience has been modified somewhat. Yeah, I, I think as we've gone from um, the store to the online experience, you know, Barney, is, as Lena said, is, is really edited for a more singular customer. Saks Fifth Avenue is much broader. We have everything from VNA to Tahari and everything in between. Um, for us, it's become about creating a service experience because Saks is a combination of luxury product as well as service. And that has been really the trigger point for us to think about our online experience. So you see online from us, Lots of copy, lots of detail, because you don't have the associate there to talk to you. You see lots more um, multiple views of the product, as you said, lots of shots. Video, in the case of some products. Shooting the inside of a handbag. More than that, showing a silhouette that shows you how that handbag falls on your body. Because again, when you're looking at a handbag in the store, the first thing you do is put it on your arm and look in that mirror. And so we're trying to kind of replicate that online as well as, you know, in the store, an associate's gonna suggest gifts to you. We spent a lot of time on gift guides and ideas around what you might wanna buy. 
um, best sellers because again, that's like that inside information that an associate can give you. Oh, this is really hot right now. Everyone loves this. We do that through offering best sellers and sharing customer feedback on those best sellers too. And then finally, it's it's the combination of all of that with the videos from designers. We do a lot of videos as well, both at our own shoots as well as shooting designers because all of our associates in the stores are trained to be able to talk to you about Donna Karen's vision for the collection and, and how it manifests itself in the line that you're seeing before you. Um, online, in some ways, it's even better to hear from Donna herself what her inspiration was as she walks you through the selections that we have on .com. So that really has been our, our focus. Do either of you link to your suppliers' websites no. directly from the site? No, that's a no-no. <laughs> well, we don't do it either at Women's Wear, so I, it certainly once, can't be critical. Once Same we've thing got them, we like to keep them. Yeah. <laughs> Video conferencing and wireless mics are the same as they were 10 years ago. <laughs> um, no, we, we generally don't do that. We're, our, our goal is to have people on our store, uh, and we need to do as good a job as we can describing the product. And, and Carl, also, since you were so early to the, yeah. you know, the mobile app game, yeah. uh, have you been surprised by the degree to which the consumer... I mean, I remember years ago when people talked about online shopping and exactly what Kimberly was saying. If you can't touch it, if you can't try it on, there's no way you're going to make the purchase. And even in the pre-internet world, you used to hear that about catalogs as their sales began to boom. Have you been surprised by the degree to which people have not only purchased the hardware which has made mobile uh, possible, but also immediately adapted it for purchasing and responded to it so enthusiastically? Because from everything I've heard from you so far, you really haven't encountered either the technical or price resistance. I know you're starting with your 70% off platform, yeah. but right. it doesn't seem to be that level of resistance that used to exist. No, no, there hasn't. And I think a lot of that comes down to what we've tried to put into the experience. And it translates to mobile and particularly the iPad very well, which is, you know, we don't have that human touch. So we go to great pains to make sure the models and the photography and the styling at least get something of that across. We're not going to just shoot the thing flat or put it in a mannequin um, because we don't have that human touch. We want the product to speak to our shopper, to speak to her. And that's why you know, our, our terrific creative director, Leah Park, spends so much time at the Brooklyn Warehouse obsessing over the details of the styling and the pose and the model. And so that's, that's one thing we do to overcome that. And it translates very well, particularly the iPad, where the screen is larger. iPhone, a little bit harder for that to come across. You know, and the other thing is, um, and again, that that's, I think has made mobile workforce uh, as well as our, our web, is that we've put sort of fun and desire into it. You know, I think if we just laid the products out there with the search box and it was there every day, I actually don't know that someone would just say, I'm going to buy that now. Um, the reason they're willing to just take that leap and press buy now off the mobile device is we've built up so much anticipation and desire by the knowledge that this is coming at 12, the scarcity that it may sell out, um, the fact that it's unquestionably good value so you're not going to have regret, price regret later. It just makes it that much easier to go directly from I want to I can have, you know. And I think that's what is getting people over the hurdle of just pressing the button. It's fun. It's addictive. We've built the desire in. And then as soon as that beautiful photography hits you and it resonates with what you think you're going to look like in that, in that item, you just jump right to buy. And it's worked for us on the web. And I think that's why it's, it, it, that's translated to mobile. And that's why they're still buying these goods off mobile. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly introduced the word measurable to this conversation, and it's certainly something we hear about a lot in the media world, and the lines between media and retailing seem to be dissolving in front of our eyes. Uh, to what degree have any of you been able to use the, these new media that we're, we're talking about to monitor? I remember when we re relaunched our website, the word we kept hearing was, well, it's great, but how do you monetize it? And to what degree, obviously, in Lena's case, you were talking about having this immense creative visual impact on the viewer uh, at the same time that has to be converted. And it seems that one thing the internet does is it makes it a little bit easier to track to what degree viewers have become purchasers. I, I could certainly ask the political question about, you know, has that amped up the pressure on you to you know, make your advertising and marketing more effective? But has it also allowed you to see exactly what percentage of viewers, for instance, are becoming purchasers? and to track the uh, profitability, for instance, of what you do online? Um, 
of course, I mean, there's analysis to all that. So obviously, we are benefiting when we launching the new collection from BNY label, and we put an effort and put a video with it and, and do a special project shoot and, and conceptualize.